Hi. Hi. This is The Philosophical Angle. And I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Nature of Aesthetics. Another which is Defining Ethics, Good and Evil. These books are available free for viewing at the www.philosophypublishing.com website. Along with me is my panelist, Rick Samuelson. Rick graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Wharton, an MA from Tufts, and is retired from the investment banking industry. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the concepts and topics in current media and offer an explication of their essence. This week, the topic of concern is the recent protests about the online video on YouTube of a uh, video that expresses concern, or it's a satire, really, of, the, uh, of Muhammad and his life. Satires by themselves have been around for centuries in literature and in all types of art. So this is nothing new. As a matter of fact, I think it uh, wasn't too long ago that an artist put a picture or a sculpture of Christ inside a jar of urine and displayed that as art. We heard not howls of, well, we heard protests but not violent protests. Uh, but here in this one, we've heard violent protests from the Muslim community. <clears throat> and we've heard apologies for that from, our, from the US government. Now the question is here, should we as a people and should our representatives in the government defend free speech and particularly free art, free communication through art. And in this case, it was a satire. And I say satire because it's, uh, it's done through the eyes of the, of the Western viewer. Uh, there was one segment inside this video uh, where Muhammad and his wives are present inside a tent. And as we all know, uh, Muhammad had many wives. And here they are, they're all running around inside, and they're all angry at him for some reason. So this is kind of the Western man's nightmare. He's got a bunch of wives running around with their pots and pans after him. A Western man would go, this is a nightmare, I don't want anything. Why would anybody have 12 wives? So, well, he does. It's, uh, I guess, the, the culture then, and uh, it remains culture presently. But nevertheless, to a Western person, you could, you could easily envision being nagged for the rest of your life all the time. So it's kind of a nightmare. So it's a satire. <clears throat> There are other more uh, serious sections to the video that are not so comical, uh, that are satirizing some serious actions in the life of Muhammad. Uh, as, we, uh, as we probably know that Muhammad's had some, um, did some uh, violent acts, and whether they are, uh, can be upheld as ethical or not, uh, is not our discussion here today. But uh, what is of ethical nature, what is of an ethical nature is uh, one of the subjects of today. So with, uh, so let's turn to our notes and start to analyze the, uh, the problem here. First, we've got the video. We have free speech. We have the government not really backing up our free speech, apologizing for the free speech of this artist, and the ethics of the situation.
Here at the center of the problem is the online Muslim video, and it's a satire. And I thought it was not bad. I've seen worse. Now, within that satire, we have the question of the ethicality of the, of the center f central figure, which is Muhammad, or whether he's unethical, which is really the subject of the video. Now, after viewing the, uh, the satire, the audience will have a reaction, of course. Some will be neutral, and some will agree or disagree. They'll be anti-film, pro-film. Well, as we know, those who have are anti-film are mostly in the uh, Muslim camp. They're offended uh, because they uphold uh, Muhammad as a righteous and person to be emulated, and that's right out of the Quran. They feel that they cannot criticize uh, anything to do with Muhammad, and, and a satire does criticize him. There's no question about that. Um, and because uh, Muhammad is the ideal man, the man that we must emulate, uh, the Muslim feels that the satire is inappropriate and actually unethical and therefore worthy of a violent protest. In fact, they consider it a blaspheme. And they, and to back this up, probably they are referring to, uh, I, in the Quran, Surah 5, verse 33. Now the Quran is made up of chapters, which, is, which they call Surah, and, uh, and the verses, uh, which is a kind of how the Bible is laid out, although the Quran is not laid out chronologically. But let me read to you Surah 533 from the Quran. The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger, that is Muhammad, and strive with might and main for mischief through the land is execution or crucifixion or the cutting off of hands and feet from opposite sides or exile from the land. That is their disgrace in this world, and a heavy punishment is theirs in the hereafter. So it is clear that it is a very severe penalty for an anti-Muslim, particularly an anti-Muhammad action such as this video. Uh, from the Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam by Robert Spencer, uh, it is noted the traditional Muslim view is, unfortunately, alive and well. It was firmly restated several years ago by Pakistan's Federal Sharia Court, which said, and I quote, the penalty of contempt of the Holy Prophet is death and nothing else. I'd like to contrast this with something Jesus said in Matthew 10, 14. And whoever shall not receive you, nor bear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. So let's go back here to our notes. Anti-satire, one camp, very unethical, heavy penalty. The other says, well, if they didn't accept you, what can you do? You get your shoes on and you, you go to the next door or go somewhere else. So let's go back here and to the, our next chart. 
and discuss what is communication and free speech. Because we need to uphold this, whether free speech is worthy of being upheld so that, and whether the, the content of free speech, whether it be ethical or unethical, whether the action of having free speech is something worthy of our consider of, 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 of placing into our constitution and protection. Free speech, I'd like to posit, induces free choice. So if you're going to have free true freedom, I will venture to put before you that free speech is necessary. So we have free communication and the free dissemination of information. From this information, if free information is available, it comes into us and we're allowed to then use our information to construct our priorities. And priorities are, a, are pieces of knowledge which we use to order our lives and to make our decisions. For example, this video, this concern about free speech and the uh, anti-Muslim video is a concern of ours. And we've decided that uh, we've created a priority within us to saying that this is important to be talked about, so we'll spend some time on it. So we made our decision. And it's a free choice. There was no coercion involved. But, and from free choice, though, we get some remarkable results. Free choice enables a free market, whereby we can go and produce and economically prosper. But one aspect in order to make a, an economic prosperity efficient is that we need this free communication. And we need that to ensure the progression of knowledge through the dialectic process. That is, the dialogue comes in, we converse, we make our conclusions, we make a new conclusion, which is a new piece of knowledge, establish it as a priority, and then make a decision as to whether such things as to produce something or to go down to a store or to talk to our friend or, or whatever it is our decision is, uh, uh, is relevant to. And we need that because this dialectic process produces more and greater information. And that is necessary because no one entity has enough knowledge to, for all of us to operate and stay efficient in producing that which is within the free market. Now the free market has an ethicality by itself because it promotes cooperation. In order to be in the free market and people exchanging goods and producing and uh, efficiently uh, products and services, we need to cooperate. And we cooperate, and the ability to cooperate <clears throat> is from respect of another individual. That is the evolutionary aspect within our behavior that allows us to cooperate. The ability of the human being to be able to respect the other, the other person. So if we have an appropriate dispensation of respect, you have that which is ethical. And we cooperate because we consider others important. That is important, and we consider them important because they need, we need to produce goods and services. <clears throat> and producing goods and services brings our lives up away from misery, and that is good. So we've outlined our, our nature of uh, of that which is ethical. When we come back here to the problem of free speech versus the 
anti-Muslim video and its protests. So I'd like to bring in uh, Rick Samuelson and ask him what his view and opinions are regarding the, the video and the government's apologies and what are your thoughts on this process? Rick? Well, I guess I was struck by the fact that the um, U.S. government asked Google apparently to take the video off of uh, the Internet. Google apparently refused from what I understand. Well, they did because I viewed it last, I viewed this video in the last two nights, sometime in the last 24, 48 hours. So they haven't taken it off, which is good. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, so they have taken it off. They have not. Oh, they have not, right. Yeah, that's what I understood. Um, I thought there are a couple of things I would note. One, you know, 10 years ago, before the Internet became so prevalent, I suspect a lot of Islamic countries didn't pay much attention to the printed media in the West that couldn't read the language and uh, whatever was said about Muhammad that might upset them, you know, probably never reached them, or very little of it did. Now it can very rapidly. That said, that's what technology has achieved. Um, and for the government to try to intervene in dissemination of what is a form of free speech is, is rather obviously unconstitutional. So. I guess that would be the point of departure for any further comment I would make. So the government was wrong to approach Google about this. And more than that, the problem with that approach and the problem with apologizing is that the risk is uh, members of Islam in various countries will begin to think that, well, there's perhaps some game going on here. Either the United States government is so weak it can't uh, force Google to take this off of the Internet, or uh, somehow there's some collusion going on between Google and the U.S. government, so that they're pretending to try to take it off, but actually not, and therefore they're attempting to deceive us. Um, and that contrasts starkly with uh, what might have happened, namely a vigorous defense of the freedom of, freedom of speech, which the government could have undertaken when this broke and distanced itself from the whole notion that it's the government's responsibility to monitor and control free speech. Uh, it's not. Uh, and it seems that President Obama has further muddied the waters by later on offering a defense of free speech at, at the UN. So we're now in a situation where the US has sent a bunch of mixed messages, and at the end of the day, I'm sure the various members of the various Islamic countries are probably at this point confused about to what extent the United States thinks it should be able to censor free speech, uh, to what extent uh, the United States is really apologetic, uh, and to what extent um, these points of view will affect what happens in the future. So we've ended up with kind of potentially uh, the worst possible combination of uncertainty. Uh, and I I'm not surprised that members of Islam uh, now have uh, the mistaken understanding that the United States government can and should somehow intervene in, in in uh, instances where uh, there is free speech that happens to offend them. 
Right. You know, um, and then there's been some talk about creating an anti-blaspheme law, and I guess uh, some, there are some countries in Europe that have such a law, and I know that some countries in Europe uh, ban particular books such as Mein Kampf. Uh, should that be considered here in America? Well, you know, there, England used to have blasphemy laws uh, a few hundred years ago, and in the early days of this country, uh, those sorts of policies were in effect at the state level, but we got beyond that when we approved the Constitution. It, you know, it's written in, in, in black and white very clearly what the collective point of view in the United States is on free, freedom of speech. It is meant to be protected as the sacred right, period. Um, and, it, it, and it's utterly unambiguous. Um, that doesn't mean we expose our children routinely to pornography, right? Uh, but it does mean that uh, as long as one is expressing a point of view that's not meant to somehow um, mislead or um, hurt younger children, then you're pretty much free to say whatever you please, Particu particularly if it's of a philosophical or um, uh, political nature. Okay. This one I thought had a little bit of art to it, not, not deeply profound art, but I nevertheless would put it into the class of an artist uh, expressing his his view of the world, and and that and that in fact is what art is. It's the artist expressing his view of the world, uh, and I think this falls into that that category, and and should definitely should be protected. Now, to the next question, should we ever kowtow pusillanimously? to other governments, as our government seemed to just have done. Um, I know that uh, Rice um, uh, from, the, uh, from the administration got on and said uh, she blamed a, quote, a very hateful, a very offensive video that has offended many people around the world. <coughs> I note the offensive, the, the euphemism offended. Um, so anyway, I should we even kowtow, or should we be should we take this position of oh I'm so sorry, we won't do it again when actually we can't prevent it from happening again due to the the Constitution of the United States protecting free speech. What do you think, Rick? Should a government well, it's a very slippery slope, isn't it? I mean, you can I mean, you can imagine copycat efforts, you know, uh, flourishing. Uh, if you can get the president of the United States to apologize in prime time, uh, you know, what what a gas! What, 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 let's go make a video tomorrow. Um, you can imagine that kind of thinking going on, and and the United States being drawn into, or, or the administration being drawn into, sort of endless apologies. I mean, that's just plainly uh, unworkable and unnecessary. And the best thing for the United States to do is uh, you know, perhaps declare that you know, we don't sponsor or make those kinds of videos, but if private parties in this country choose to do so, it is their sacred right. Okay. Well said. I, I absolutely agree. Now, one more point or I should say one more interrogative, could we ever ban a certain video like the administration just did of uh, this anti- and, and, this, and, and by the way, the title of this video is Innocence of, of Muslims. So could we, could we uh, spotlight one video or, or as Europe did on Mein Kampf? spotlight one work uh, of, of literature or one work of a, of, a, of a video artist 
and say it's not uh, permitted here in the U.S. Yet uh, we ha and yet have a a, a, a free speech uh, amendment. Can we do that? Should we do that? Should we try? Uh, my view is no. Um, it's too slippery a slope, and in the in an atmosphere where uh, which seems to be born of the you know academic uh, milieu. Um, where political correctness is all the rage, uh, you know, the danger is that you'd be uh, censoring more, not less. Uh, and so uh, I, I, I think the, the founding fathers were very wise in making the, uh, the constitu constitutional provision protect protecting uh, free speech pretty much ironclad. Well, what about the, the possibility of it being very dangerous in other sense? In other words, when the video is made, there's a, tu a tremendous reaction to it, violence to our, uh, to our embassies, uh, and uh, America's citizens traveling in that area uh, could be the target of harmful acts. It is that, like the question uh, uh, I think once posed before the Supreme Court, where they said, there is a limit to free speech, such as you can't cry fire in a crowded theater. How about that distinction, Rick? Can it be done in such a circumstances if we consider that the, the violence of the reaction is immense? Well, I, you know, I would draw a distinction between uh, crying fire in a crowded theater and putting on pretty much any kind of video. I mean, in, in, in the former instance, you have, you know, the imminent threat of persons in your presence being physically harmed uh, with no time to consider the ramifications. Uh, in the latter instance, uh, if a video is put up on the internet, uh, people from around the world can watch it, consider what it means, and no one is in imminent threat of being harmed uh, directly as a result of watching that video. It's a passive activity. Okay. Uh, so I wouldn't compare the two that readily. Okay. Uh, good analysis. And I want to thank uh, Rick for joining us. And that's about it for this week's edition of The Philosophical Angle. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.